Jamie here from Rain Country. God is good all the time. Well, I'm here today to answer some fermenting questions. These are just going to be general fermenting questions. Part of the reason I'm doing this is because I got an email from a lady that was needing answers and I'm just unable to reply to her email no matter how many times I try. So I thought, well, why not just do a video about it? Duh. So I'm here to answer her two questions plus a few more. And again, this is general. So I'll be putting a lot of video links down below for more specifics on making various things such as how to make vinegar, how to make kimchi, how to ferment hard boiled eggs and so much more. So make sure that when this video is over with, if you want to learn how to do any of this stuff, just look down below, right below the video screen. You'll see somewhere down there, depending on your device, it'll either say the word more or show more. Just click on that to open the whole description box so that you can find all the links and other information I'll be putting down there. So let's get to that first question and that is about do you need a starter to ferment? Well, in most cases, no, you don't. But there are some things that is really recommended that you go ahead and use a starter or you really do need one. So I tend to use a starter for all of my ferments, except for vinegar, for whatever reason, it's the only one I have. a. In fact, I have a banana, I think it's a banana mango peel vinegar right here that's ready for me to strain. When I do vinegars, I never bother with it. I very rarely ever bother with a starter. The only time I would use a starter is if I was using frozen goods to make the vinegar because one thing I found in my many years of fermenting that frozen goods tend to have a little harder time getting going if at all. Whereas, I mean, sometimes they do and they can do fine, but sometimes they can get started and kind of fizzle out where I can use fresh dehydrated or freeze dried goods, no problem to ferment with. So in those, in the case that I'm using uh, frozen goods, I definitely will add a starter. So that, uh, otherwise you just might not get a good enough vinegar or wine or whatever it is that you're making. So when I make my grape wine, like I have right here, this is the last batch I made. This is from the grapes from my own garden. Because, especially since I do freeze my grapes ahead of time, uh, it makes them easier to press the juice out, then I definitely do add a starter. But I always add starters, whether I'm making wine or mead in that case. I've never tried making a wine or mead without a starter, but I know that if you're using a raw honey to make your mead, you shouldn't really have to add a starter. Same thing with your, if you're pressing the juice straight out of your fruits and they're fresh, you shouldn't have to use a starter in that case. I've just never done that. So I've never tried making a wine or mead without it. Now, uh, and by the way, there's a couple of different types of starters you can use. Some people will use whey that they've strained off of different cultured dairy products such as cottage cheese, yogurt, or just making a hard cheese that whatever it is you strain off of there is the way and because it's cultured that can make a good starter a lot of times that one is commonly used for making a beet kvass but i never use that because if i do have yogurt and stuff like that on hand i'm usually consuming the way right along with that but i do make my own starters which are super super easy to make out of just about anything when you might have heard of a ginger bug a gi ginger bug is the most common one to use but it's made the same way ginger can be pretty expensive if you don't grow it it can be pretty expensive to find raw ginger for making your starter well right here is i do actually have ginger but i also have dandelion flowers in there and you can make your starters out of anything. You can make it out of any herb you got growing, as long as it's edible, anything in your garden, it doesn't matter. Uh, you can make it out of raisins. Again, you can use dried or freeze dried fruits. I've always experimenting. I've used freeze dried raspberries to make a starter just to see how well it worked. Worked great, just like the raisins, which are dehydrated grapes. Anyway, that will be one of the videos I'll link to down below is how to make and use a fermentation starter and that gets used in any ferment that I make except for typically vinegar it gets used in every other ferment I make whether it be fermented garlic fermented eggs fermented snow peas I've done those before wine mead natural sodas I use that starter in there to get that juice fermenting that way it's, it's all ready to drink within three days it's good and 
busy and bubbly. That's the other great thing about using a starter is it can really help speed up the process. But a lot of times like with kimchi and other types of fermented vegetables, sauerkraut, you don't have to add a starter. I do though. When I started making kimchi like 25 years ago, I used to do it the traditional old fashioned method where you use the brine, you let it break down overnight, then you rinse it out, and then you just put it in your jars and start fermenting after you add all your spices and whatever else you want to put in there. And that was great. I liked it. I'd let it ferment for two weeks and it was wonderful, though sometimes I had failures, which was really a disappointment when I had to dump out a whole batch because it wasn't cheap to put that together. And then the time waiting for that. So when I learned about the ginger bug and started making my the mead first was the first thing I started making. I thought, why not try this with kimchi just to see what happens. And with Within three to four days, I get a nice bubbly, fizzy kimchi, yet it's still nice and crunchy the way I really like it, where sometimes a longer ferment can make your cabbage a little softer. This was, I love it this way. It's not necessary, but it's my favorite way to do it now is using the starter for that. So when it comes to some things, it's just a matter of choice, whichever method you like best. But again, not necessary to add a starter to most of your, for your vegetables, especially if they're organic and fresh or dried, not frozen. Okay, the next question is, can you store fermented foods in your pantry? Well, yes, you can, even your fruits and vegetables. I personally would not store my fermented eggs in the pantry, though I have left them out on the counter for a week or so as I worked through them. Um, I would personally, even though they're fermented, I'd still be a little bit nervous when it comes to eggs for leaving them out too long outside of refrigeration. If I don't think I'm gonna work through the eggs fast enough, then I do put them in the refrigerator. But typically, most things, yes, you can store in the pantry. Other than a few things, a lot of the things that I ferment are not for the purpose of long term. And so a lot of the stuff I just keep in my refrigerator. Anyway, I don't keep a ton of fermented foods on hand, especially since I can have it fermented within a few days. But um, I can dehydrate goods and then make it like, like I did my experiment where I used dehydrated cabbage, carrots, onions, and made a kimchi entirely out of dehydrated goods and it turned out great. So I would prefer to just go ahead and dehydrate the stuff. It takes up less room in storage. And then if I want some kimchi, just whip that up real quick. Within three days of fermenting, I have a nice, wonderful kimchi. But I do know of people who will store their fermented foods throughout the year using a root cellar or some other type of cold storage. Really, when it comes to fermented goods, it is best to keep it in a cold, not frozen, but cold storage because what, I, what you'll find is that because of the fermenting process, if it doesn't stay cold enough, it'll get very fizzy and it will keep wanting to bubble over and it can make a mess in your pantry. So if you're gonna do that, I highly recommend keeping each of your jars in something that can catch whatever bubbles over. Because I've had this happen in a cabinet I have back there and it, it made just a huge mess. And so I'm getting away from doing anything like that. And then when it comes to storing meads and vinegars and wines, like this is vinegar right here. This is one of my floral vinegars that I use for my hair. I either store them in half gallon jars with a good airtight lid. So using the plastic leak proof lids with a silicone liner to really seal it up good. This is important when it comes to vinegar because vinegar will just keep It'll, if it gets air exposure, oxygen exposure, it'll just keep going if it's not distilled, if it's a raw vinegar, until it eats through all the vinegar too and all you're left with is some nasty water. It just basically reverts back to water without the sugar because the sugar's all been eaten through. So a good airtight lid. So once I strain all this out and put it into a clean half gallon jar, then I put that tight lid on there to prevent that from happening. Or I use a swing top bottles like you see with this vinegar or like this mead that I've had for probably 15 years. It's got a silicone ring here and it's very, very well sealed. But if you're using jars like this to store your kombucha, your mead, your wine, your vinegar, go with the Italian brand. I think it's Bormioli. They're the same ones that make the Fido jars. 
those of you don't want to get the cheap Chinese made bottles because they will burst on you under pressure. People have shared that with me before, so make sure you know what you're getting. It's good to pay a little bit more for a good Italian made bottle. Now, the last three questions, what can I ferment? Well, you can pretty much ferment anything, <laughs> anything you want. Most people are looking at fermenting fruits, vegetables, and juices. But like I said, you can ferment eggs. I've heard of people fermenting meat. I've never tried it. I'm not actually interested, but there is a Swedish dish that's a fermented fish, but I guess it uh, smells terrible and a lot of people think it tastes terrible. I'm personally not interested in that, but yes, you can ferment pretty much anything you want. As I said, I fermented snow peas in the past just to try that out and they were pretty good. I'll pro I might consider doing that again soon. And they stayed in the refrigerator for like a year. I kept forgetting they were in there and they were still good. Uh, same thing with garlic. I do like to ferment garlic every now and then. It makes it easy to use because it's just, it's peeled, it's fermented. You just pull it out, chop it up, it's ready to go. I've also fermented onions the same way just to have them handy and ready for use. They're already chopped up and fermenting them like that does actually preserve all the nutrients. So if you're wanting to turn around and then take that garlic and make a honey infused garlic, then just use that garlic that's already fermented and then add the honey in there and let it sit for at least three days to a week. And then you have this nice, wonderful fermented honey infused garlic. Oh, and you can also ferment your grains. One time, I back when I used to soak my grains before I dried them and then ground them up for flour, uh, one time I forgot I had some soaking and I let them soak way too long and they actually started to ferment. They got bubbly and I got that fermented aroma to them and so I thought well these are still good they just fermented and so what I did was I went ahead and dried them out and then ground them up and used them to make bread with and they just tasted like sourdough so there you go and you can even ferment your bread dough so let's just say you're not because that's basically what a sourdough is but let's just say you start you don't have a sourdough you can add a starter like this and then let your bread dough ferment for a few days and then you can make a bread out of that. And I even have a video on that as well that I'll put in the description box. Number four is how long does it take to ferment? Well, that's gonna depend on what you're making. Vinegars, wines, and meads all take 30 days, roughly. It can be a little less or a little more. It's gonna de depend on the temperature of the area that they're fermenting and it's going to depend on your taste so if you want a more lightly fermented wine or mead where you still have lots of fizz and sweetness maybe you're only going to ferment it for three weeks or three and a half weeks if you want it to totally work through all the sugars and have a very dry wine a very dry mead you're going to let it go for a minimum of 30 days and possibly longer when you're talking about fermented like making a natural soda for instance, like I like to do with spruce tips or, or any kind of juice. You have some kind of juice on hand. It could be orange juice, grape juice, apple juice. You just add a starter, let it sit for three days, and then you have a nice fizzy drink that has a very, very, very minuscule amount of alcohol in it that is so small that it's safe for children. But then if you're fermenting something like sauerkraut or kimchi, you might want to let that sit for longer than three days to have it, let it start taking on a more sour flavor when you're doing that. So it's all gonna depend on your taste and what it is that you're fermenting. And then the fifth one is what are the benefits of fermented foods? When you ferment your fresh produce, it's definitely going to last longer in your fridge or in a cold storage than fresh produce that you just put in there as is. It's, so it's gonna keep it for a lot longer period of time. Plus it's gonna add the gut friendly benefits of those probiotics through the fermentation process. So for a lot of people, like Stacy, I know she does a lot of fermenting. She ferments quite a bit of the produce she gets from her garden. And, um, that's, and so that's one way you can put up your food if you like fermented foods. It's not for everyone. Now, I do like fermented foods, but I don't like everything fermented all the time. It's just sometimes, you know, sometimes I get a craving for kimchi or even some fermented beets. I'll make the beet kvass and then drink that and then I'll eat the beets when I'm done. But a lot of times, like I said, with the garlic and onions and certain other things, I ferment them just so that when I put them in the fridge, they will last for a very long time. I've actually had fermented goods in there for a couple of years that got buried to the back of our fridge and forgot about them. Still good, still good. So they can last for a very long time. In cold storage, I cannot attest to how long they last 
outside of cold storage. So maybe some other people that do put their stuff up in just a pantry, their fermented goods, they can share that down below how long theirs has lasted. But a lot of times when I'm making things like kimchi, fermented eggs, that's something I'm gonna eat through right away anyway. All right, well, that, those are the five questions I was gonna cover today. If you have any more questions, please put them in comments down below. And if I already have a video on that, I'll go ahead and link it to it, or I'll tackle that in the next fermenting related video. Hope you enjoyed this and it helped answer a few questions for you. Thanks for watching, take care, and God bless.